strongly agree that mild to moderate RI significantly affects postoperative satisfaction and cataract refractive for patients, so that by improving the ocular surface, we become better surgeons. Current diagnostics that you use, 95% uh, of you use tear breakup time, uh, 94 do staining, only 81 do Schirmers, uh, and Osmolar is the last year by 17% of you, which is a lot, and interferometry, which would be uh, liver view, is 9%, 9.7%. Another interesting question, when should advanced diagnostic tests be performed at initial point of care on a case-by-case -case basis so that you see no value uh, in adding that? So half of you say uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, that's very reasonable. We've adopted an initial point of care, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. And I just close these slides by saying that this year, we hope to have 2,000 of you take this survey so that we can have better information about the unmet needs in ophthalmology so that ASTRAs can respond to what you want to hear about. And we encourage all of you to either uh, go to our booth, and there's a clinical survey booth there, or you can go to www.iworld.org slash survey. And if you take these tests, you become one of uh, 15 possible winners uh, of an iPad. So we encourage you to take this test, and it's uh, painless. It will provide us with very useful information about what we should be doing as an organization. So ocular surface diagnostics then and now. Um,
put up, maybe, maybe I get a little better. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the impact of ocular surface disease on your cataract patients, and these are my financial disclosures, and I work with several companies who are involved in ocular surface uh, diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, so how common are these disorders? And I think the survey, uh, Eric, uh, showed these results do, uh, do show that these are quite significant in numbers and impact on your, on your outcomes. So we look at prevalence, there's uh, many different studies, and uh, needless to say, um, they do show that there's a significant number of the range, depending on how you define ocular surface disease or dry eyes, and we're from 8% to as high as 48%, so we, we do know it's very, very common. Um, again, the range 7% to 40, 35, 34% worldwide. The U.S. Beaver Dam Population Study, which is a, which is a, a, a kind of a landmark study, 14% of uh, adults, 48 to 91, had dry eye, and more common in women, 17% uh, versus males, 11%. And then another large study, women's health study and physician health study showed, again, 7% of all women and 4% of all males over 50. And again, it, depending on how you define it, I think these numbers are actually low. We do know that uh, dry eye uh, is uh, increasing with the uh, increasing age. And as patients live longer, we're going to have more patients to treat with dry eye. And we also have learned that there are different subtypes. And a decade ago, I think we assumed that all dry eye was aimless care deficiency and how wrong we were. The most common cause of dry eye far away is my mobile gland dysfunction with evaporative dry eye. The second most common cause is, is the mixed pattern with evaporative and uh, aqueous tear deficiency. And then pure aqueous tear deficiency, uh, while it does occur, is, is, uh, is the least common. Uh, so MGD, uh, it, it, when we think of dry eye, we have to start thinking more about myoma gland dysfunction uh, because the, the, the treatments are certainly different than pure aqueous tear deficiency. So MGD is the leading cause of dry eye throughout the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's influenced by age, hormonal disturbances, and topical medications. And the insufficient lipid layer creates a hyperosmolarity of the, the tear film, leading to evaporation of the tears, um, and again, is extremely common. Why do MGD patients or blepharitis patients come in the office? Well, uh, about 34% come in because they, they have symptoms of their eye lid, but more commonly, 41% come in complaining of what we'd say classic dry symptoms were, this is how we get this confusion with their, their, their evaporative dry eye. But uh, the symptoms can be identical between evaporative dry eye and aqueous tear deficiency. And uh, I think another number important to point out that 16% of patients with my moment gland dysfunction actually come in as surgical patients uh, and it's important to, uh, to diagnose these patients and treat them. We need to certainly re uh, remember Sjogren's disease. Uh, Sjogren's disease or Sjogren's syndrome uh, is important because these patients have the most severe type of dry eye, a profound uh, aqueous tear deficiency, and a lot of them do have MGD as well. Um, it's important because these patients get into cornea problems with coil inflammation, neovascularization, thinning, and, uh, and, and potential severe loss of vision. Three out of four patients with Sjogren's syndrome are, un are uh, undiagnosed, um, and we know this is much more common in women. And as many as one in 10 patients who present with dry eye may have Sjogren's syndrome, so we want to think about this. Um, along with undiagnosed Sjogren's uh, syndrome, we, we understand that all uh, dry eyes are diagnosed. It's estimated there are 55 million Americans with a dry eye disease and about 40 million Americans with undiagnosed dry eye. And this number is going up every year because of the aging population. Uh, a study by Jody Lux uh, and, and his group looked at prospectively look at patients presenting for routine cataract surgery. So they evaluate 200 eyes and 100 patients, and 59% had diagnosis of blepharitis, and 61% had a, a, a rapid tear break of time correlating with the diagnosis of MGD. So again, about 60% of these patients who came in for cataract surgery had a diagnosis of MGD. So why is it important to diagnose it? Uh, not only are you gonna make your patients symptomatically better, but you're going to improve your outcomes and, uh, and have happier patients after mm -hmm. surgery. So we've made all these changes in the way we do cataract surgery with, with better implants, multifocal implants, and femtosecond laser, and uh, we have custom ablations in our, in our uh, coil-based uh, laser surgery. Uh, but the 
these advances are certainly neutralized by uh, patients with dry eye and a poor ocular surface. As we all know, the cure film is the first refractive interface, um, and it's the most important uh, refractive uh, uh, part of the eye. Uh, the uh, precordial diaphragm and the provide over uh, two-thirds of the, the uh, optical power of the eye. So any disruption of the tear film and epithelial layer will cause a profound effect on the quality of vision. Uh, it affects the way we preoperatively obtain data and make decisions for our patient. It affects our ability to get accurate uh, K readings, topography, and certainly waveframe <coughs> amorometry for our refractive surgery patients. So potential problems we get with a patient with undiagnosed dry eye coming in for your cataract test testing, we may exclude a patient who actually with a treated dry eye could be a good multifocal IOL patient. We may tell them to have the normal topography, we don't recommend a multifocal IOL. We may select the wrong uh, IOL power uh, based on that normal case in topography. We uh, may make the wrong plans for management of astigmatism, whether we're doing relaxing incisions, femtosecond incisions, or, or toric lenses. We may put the lens on the wrong axis, and then we may have an unhappy patient, and we assume it's the implants and the and the uh, and the uh, dynamics of the implant. We may un un perform unnecessary eyeball exchanges because the patient has not had the dry treated. Irregularities of the tear film cause the scatter of lightning to degrade the retinal image by 20 to 40 percent, and, and that's that's why we get such a profound complaint of. Uh, fluctuating vision and then the, the blink with the disruption of the tear film and evaporation causes uh, again further decrease in visual acuity and increase in high order aberrations and this is a schematic kind of showing the additive effect of the disruption of the tear film uh, with a, a multifocal IOL and certainly if I look at an unhappy multifocal IOL patient uh, the, the most common cause I first look at is the quality of the ocular surface in an undiagnosed dry eye but actually to tell you today is we need to diagnose and treat these patients preoperatively instead of waiting to respond postoperatively. So we have this patient with moderate ocular surface disease who may not have a lot of complaints and we perform surgery and then we, we put all these drops on after surgery and then we've done some relaxing incisions to manage the astigmatism which causes a further neurotrophic effect and now we have this patient postoperatively now that has significant coronal staining is blaming you the surgeon for bad surgery bad outcomes with her cataract surgery, when all along it was their ocular surface that put the patient in this predicament. So patient satisfaction and comfort uh, certainly is, is profoundly impacted by undiagnosed uh, dry eye. And again, we're much better off diagnosing and treating it preoperatively than responding it postoperatively. And dry eye certainly is the most common cause of dissatisfaction. 28% uh, of uh, LASIK patients are dissatisfied with their outcome due to dry eye. 15% of uh, multifocal IOL patients, and again, they blame the symptoms either on the surgery or, or the technology, and they, we, we forget the real culprit is the quality of the eye surface. So in summary, certainly dry eye is very common in your, in your refractive patient population, but even more common in your cataract patient population, has a significant impact on vision, comfort, and quality of life for your patient, and can have a significant impact on your outcomes, and it really is imperative that you think about dry eye when you're evaluating these patients. And I believe we need to do a better job of screening and diagnosing. And I do think advanced tear film diagnostics can help. It can improve our ability to preoperatively diagnose dry eye. It can improve our ability to get more accurate preoperative testing and maximize our outcomes. And, and again, as we move to this aging population, and I think we're going to be really overwhelmed with patients, we need to be more efficient and better at diagnosing as well as treating dry eye. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. You know, you, you talked about a very important symptom there, and that is uh, visual fluctuation. I usually hear that all the time, and, and for some reason, I always used to think some people call it the surgery. Um, you talk about visual fluctuation. Vision's better in the morning, but in the evening, it's not so good. I run the computer after a while, my computer vision gets blurry. It changes between blinks. Uh, I find that to be a, a crucial symptom in, uh, in diagnosing dry eye disease. What does visual fluctuation mean to you, Ed? Well, it means the patient most likely has evaporative dry eye, so they, 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 this unstable tear film, when they, when they blink, they're going to get a short time of some quality vision, and as the tear evaporates, then they're going to the, the, the degradation in, the, in their visual image. And again, we think about, you know, should dry eye patients be complaining of pain? 
but as you said, Eric, actually fluctuation in vision is probably as common or more common than the patient complaining of eye, 